It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Today on the Happy Families Podcast, answering your questions. Happyfamilies.com.au is where you go. Click on the podcast link and then just press the button. Easy to use. Start talking and you can send messages through just like this one. Hi, Justin and Kylie. I love your podcast. I am a long-time listener and this is actually for my friend. Uh, My friend is a single mum and has been since pregnancy. Uh, Her son is 10 years old who has started suddenly being aggressive and disrespectful. He is always angry with her and doesn't listen. He does things and says things intentionally to upset her. Because my friend is single, her wage is going just to rent and food. Sometimes she can't even afford the food. She has used all of her free mental health sessions on her son and she can't afford the ongoing psychologist or even an assessment for his behaviour. She feels extremely stuck and is at the point of which she's saying to me that she just wants to call the police to take him away from her. For the context, the child has no father in his life. They've never met. The mother has had a handful of relationships over the years, but nothing has stuck. He has been raised by his mum and a family friend and his grandparents are not so much in the picture. He has just changed schools this year, but is doing well at school, so it seems. I just want to know if you can tell me how best to support her as a friend and what services there are available for those with a single income and who don't have the ability to pay for these things. If there are any tips you can give me to pass on to her when this child is being erratic and violent and aggressive when she's alone in the house with him and how to calm him down and to talk to him. Thanks so much. Wow. Uh, Thanks so much, Anonymous, for sending that message through. 10 years old, wanting to call the police, feeling unsafe. I mean, this is... This is a really, really tough story, and and it's totally unfair. Research around this, boys and single mums, there are just no easy wins here. Now, I know that a lot of people say we've got to support diverse families, we've got to be encouraging about this, and I, I totally agree with that, but the reality is, statistically, this is just a really, really tough spot. In Australia at the moment, 15% of Australian families are uh, run by single parents, single parent households, 15%, 80% of those are single mums. So... That pretty much means 12% of Australian family households where there are dependents in the home run by mum. And Hilda surveys from just last year, This uh, Hilda is the Household Income and Labour Dynamics in Australia survey. November last year, average income of a single parent family in Australia, $34,000. It's actually dropped from $38,000 a few years ago. Cost of living, rent crisis, mental health challenges. I mean, how are you supposed to pay for a psychologist under those circumstances is just so hard. I think it's impossible. I I don't know how you're supposed to do it. Centrelink benefit, by the way, I looked it up, $987 per fortnight for a single parent. $987, that's less than 500 bucks a week. And you're supposed to be, show me somewhere where you can rent for less than 500 bucks a week and still put food on the table, run a car and all that sort of thing. This is just a really tough spot. So a handful of things that I'm going to say. First off, when it comes to getting psychological help, my first recommendation would be don't worry about getting psychological help for your son. I'd be looking for it in terms of support for parenting. Uh, Research shows pretty comprehensively that when kids get psychological help, let's say on Tuesday morning at 9.30, and then they start to have a meltdown on Friday afternoon at 3.30 or 5 o'clock, they don't say, hmm, I should think back to what my psychologist told me on Tuesday and implement that. They just don't do it. They don't have the emotion regulation. They don't have the frustration tolerance. They don't have the delayed gratification. They don't have the executive function. They, They don't have the skills to be able to do that. Whereas for us as parents, we do. So what I would be recommending when there's some funding available, when there's some cash available, get mum help first. She's going to get more value learning effective parenting than he's going to get being told that he needs to control his anger. That doesn't mean that he doesn't need help. He really does. But I don't think that psychological help is the help that he needs. When I listen to this, what I hear is good men need to be around this kid. He doesn't have his dad in his life. Grandparents are barely involved. There's no indication of other good men. So I just love that you're a friend who wants to support. 
I wish the government could do more. I really do. But ultimately, this is going to be an individual responsibility thing. The government's too busy blowing multi-billions of dollars on desalination plants and billions of dollars on sporting stadiums and spending hundreds of millions of dollars in Victoria to not host the Commonwealth Games that they said they would host. Uh, the, the government excess. I mean, the billions of dollars a year that they spend on advertising so that they can tell everyone how good a job they're doing. We can't rely on the government. And, and NDIS funding, that's blowing out. It was supposed to cost 16 bill. It's currently at 42 billion and it's going up. And unfortunately, it's not being used well. I know too many people that work in NDIS systems and the stories of excess and the way that people are taking advantage of the system when there are people who are so desperately in need uh, is just devastating. I know that many people are using it the right way. And that's wonderful. That's what it's there for. But there's just too much abuse of this system. So if this is going to be an individual thing, and that's kind of what you've said, right? I want to be there. I want to be a supporting friend. I just think that's wonderful. Here's how I think that you can support. Number one, uh, there will be some services that are available that could be helpful, um, but they differ depending on which community you're in. Uh, The free services, things like Beyond Blue, Black Dog, that kind of stuff, they're fairly general. I think we need some specific kinds of help here. So that's the first thing I'd say. Beyond that, here's what I think this little guy needs. He needs families in their circle, families in their community, to engage with them as a family. So what am I talking about here? I'm, I'm saying maybe go on a picnic and invite them. Get three or four or five families who are all willing to say, hey, one day a week, let's have them over for a barbecue or let's do a games night or let's do a picnic down at the beach or down at the park. Let's keep this kid socially engaged and give some support to mum as well. It's going to make such a difference for her. If you're part of a broader community, maybe there's even the capacity to drop a meal around spontaneously or uh, an Uber voucher, an Uber Eats voucher, just to lighten the load because that financial load, it's, it's overwhelming. It's so hard to concentrate on anything else. The second thing that I'd say outside of engaging with the family is keep this kid busy, getting him involved in sports, getting him involved in extracurricular activities. Obviously, there's a financial challenge here, but to the extent that there are scholarships available, to the extent that there's charity available, maybe somebody in the community is willing to say, hey, I'm happy to fork out the 250 or 400 bucks per term so this kid can stay off the streets and be wearing himself out developing competence and skills and making friends. This sort of thing is going to make such a big difference for mum. She gets a little bit of a lightening of the load, but also for this kid as he gets to engage in these activities. And lastly, recruit good men. He needs to learn what it is to be a good man, to learn how to help the people around him feel stronger and safer. That's the essence of healthy masculinity. And at the moment, I just don't think he's seeing it enough. I wish I could offer more. It's, like I said, almost an impossible, unfair situation. And unfortunately, we keep on seeing that there is a two-parent privilege. Um, We can talk about the importance of diversity in families, and it is. But ultimately, the stats don't support this as being an optimal way to raise a family. If that's where you are, all my compassion, my heart goes out to you. Uh, But this is a really tough job. All right, let's take a look at question number two. Hi, Dr. Justin and Kylie. I'm calling you regarding my son, who is six-year-old, calling you from London. And we are originally from Melbourne, but we have moved to London about one and a half years ago. It's certainly a big change for my little one. By by this time, he's completely adjusted to the new way of life. However, we've been traveling extensively, and I've noticed ever since my son has turned six, he has shown signs of aggression or, you know, anger more and more. He realizes what anger is, but he doesn't know what to do about it or how to control it. And because we've been traveling a lot, we've landed in very embarrassing situations sometimes, you know, when we are at a dinner or maybe at a cruise or at the airport and everyone's just looking at us and I have this shouting, yelling child who doesn't really know how to control his anger or communicate what he wants us to do to help him in that situation. I've realized that there are a couple of things that trigger it. Um, Of course, when he's tired or angry, hungry and thirsty, I don't know how to stop him from 
believing that he can get his way all the time or he can buy things all the time. But I really don't know how to handle this situation. So I hope you can help me. I love your show. And thank you for all the support that you provide for parents like us. Well, good for you for packing up and having the adventure of a lifetime. Heading off to London sounds amazing. Uh, We do have a little bit of a challenge, though, because our kids, they just rely on stability and predictability so they can feel good about the world. And, um, and, And they don't tend to respond too well to a whole lot of upheaval. Having said that, If the travel is happening with you and you're there and you're stable and you're predictable, then he'll probably be okay. So a couple of things about what to do when kids are having these big emotional meltdowns, when they're being really challenging. First off, emotion regulation is something that develops over time. I know plenty of adults that are still lousy, lousy at emotion regulation. So it starts to develop somewhere around about the age of, let's say, three. Um, That's when kids start to realize, hang on, I can use my emotions in effective ways to do what needs to be done. Emotion regulation is about expressing those emotions or keeping it together because I've got something that I'm looking to achieve. So the first thing to highlight here is emotion regulation develops on a continuum. It starts around about two or three, and by the time kids are about nine, that's That's when they're getting good at expressing or holding their emotions together, depending on what their goals are. They know what's expected socially. They usually do a lot better at it. Boys, they develop a little slower than girls. And uh, so it may be a little bit more than nine, but usually that's about the age. Given that you're dealing with a six-year-old, what you're describing is actually... It's pretty normal. Kids are least likely to be regulated when they're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or stressed. Just remember the German police officer says, halt. Halt means stop. Uh, It's really hard to stop your emotions when you are hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or stressed. Like your willpower, your self-control, your ability to delay gratification, your frustration tolerance, your executive function, they all take a a really big dip when those factors uh, are there, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and stressed. So what do you do? That's really what the question is. What, What am I supposed to do when these big emotions are happening? The first thing I want to emphasize is compassion is important, okay? We don't want to be blowing up. We don't want to be getting angry at the kids. But the second thing I want to emphasize is that kids need to understand that there are some things that are okay and some things are not okay when it comes to their behavior. And at about the age of six, in fact, maybe a bit before that, they can start to get that message loud and clear. So there's a movement. It's been around for a long time now that kids should never hear no. In childcare centers, for example, Those who work in early childcare are not supposed to say the word no to kids. I think that's garbage. Honestly, I just think that's rubbish. Kids have got to hear no. For the rest of your life, you're going to hear no. It's not that no is a problem. It's the way that it's said. So give your little guy a no and say, I love you, kiddo, but the answer is no. Or wouldn't it be great if you could? When when, when you say to a child, don't you just wish? Wouldn't it be great if you could? What you're really saying is no. You're just saying it with a whole lot of empathy and a whole lot of kindness. Don't you just wish we could buy that thing? Wouldn't it be great if we could go over there and do what you want to do? Oh, that would just be amazing, wouldn't it? Guess what? No. You're just saying it really nicely. So I I call that giving them in fantasy what they can't have in reality. I don't think that it's healthy for kids to grow up and not hear no. Because I'll tell you what, once they're six or eight or 10 or 12 and they hear no for the first time, they'll fall apart. Like they've got to develop the ability to take no. In fact, I think that the greater your ability to take no and then keep on going and to persist becomes one of the most important lifelong skills. So I wouldn't be worrying about saying no. What I would be doing is trying to work out how to say no in a way that minimizes the reaction. But here's the thing. When someone gets told no or when someone can't do something, no matter how you say it, there's going to be disappointment. There's going to be frustration. There's going to be potentially an outburst, especially with a six-year-old boy. So when that happens, let him be upset about it. Again, it's not our job to protect our children from all of those negative emotions. If it's not appropriate for him to be doing something, then he can't do it. And that's okay. You don't have to live into that emotion with him. You don't have to magnify the emotion with him. You don't have to talk about his feelings. A simple, don't you just wish, wouldn't it be great? Sorry, kiddo, not going to happen today. That's all. And then let it be. If you can be kind and gentle afterwards, if you can be relatively nonplussed and unaffected by his temper tantrum, he's going to get over it really fast. The last thing I'll say is this. If he is really upset, if this is really going on, just look at him and say, hey, buddy, I know how upset you are. It really feels horrible when you don't get to do what you want to do. And then offer him a hug or offer him some space. Do you want a hug? Do you want to talk about it or do you just want to be left alone? 
he'll let you know. Once he's worked through and processed that emotion, he'll be okay again. That's the process. The whole pandering to our kids, becoming our children's therapists, making their emotions king, that's not helpful and that's not healthy. It's not growing resilient kids. That big emotion that your child's feeling, it's like a train going into a tunnel. Some tunnels are long and dark and deep, but the train always comes out the other end of the tunnel. Same goes here. His emotion will subside. And if you can be soft and kind and gentle, as you say no, and soft and kind and gentle when the train comes out the other side, he'll be all right. Let me restate. The answer is no. Don't you wish you could? Wouldn't it be great? Oh, buddy, you're really upset. I get it. Do you want a hug? Do you want to talk? Or do you just want some space? Then once things are calm, you can ask him if he wants to talk about it or if you just want to get on with life. And that should be all you need to do. Thanks so much for your questions. Happyfamilies.com.au. Click on podcasts and then push the button. Start talking and we'll get your voice memo. Love answering your questions. Happyfamilies.com.au. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rowland for Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. For more info about making your family happier, check us out on TikTok, on Instagram, or at Facebook, Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families. Thank you.